On behalf of the Center for Indic Studies, Indus University, Ahmedabad, and the Gandhi Research Foundation, Jalgaon, I welcome you all to this webinar. This event is being organized in collaboration with various esteemed national institutions, including the Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, the Indian Council of Historical Research, the Indian Council of Social Science Research, and the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. I warmly welcome all the various dignitaries and esteemed guests from these various institutions who are gracing this occasion today. I also welcome all other esteemed guests who are present with us today. What could be a more auspicious day than Guru Purnima to celebrate the work and life of Sri Dharampal Ji? He initiated many seekers on the path of rediscovering India. So before we begin our proceedings, I request everyone to join me for Deep Prajwalan, followed by a recitation of Guru Mantra. Let us now begin the inaugural session of an year-long webathon, which is designed to celebrate the birth centenary of Sri Dharampalji, whose dates are 1922 to 2006. Today is the inaugural session which is going to set the stage for a series of monthly webinars that will be held over the course of one long year. These webinars will be centered on various important works authored by Sri Dharampalji. Like Dharampalji's works, these webinars will focus on a wide range of topics from Indian science, technology, medicine, education, village communities, and civil movements to the philosophical underpinnings of Indian culture. In these webinars, eminent experts, some of whom are present with us today, belonging to various disciplines, will discuss Dharampalji's work and its relevance for their respective subject areas. I now invite Professor Geeta Dharampal, daughter of Sri Dharampal, to introduce the theme of today's session and give a warm welcome speech on behalf of the Gandhi Research Foundation, Jalgaon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ankur Kakar. And my very warm welcome to everybody who has joined us in this virtual space. I feel truly privileged, but also humbled to have this once in a lifetime opportunity to say a few words of welcome on behalf. Hello? Yes, Kitaji, we can hear ah, you. Ah, you. My screen has gone blank. Uh, to say a few words of welcome on behalf of the Gandhi Research Foundation, along with the chief organizers from the Center for Index Studies, Dr. Ram Sharma and Dr. Ankur Kakkar at this very auspicious occasion on Guru Purnima, for which we have just heard the inspiring and melodious benediction, to open the inaugural session of our year-long webathon in celebration of Shri Dharampal's outstanding contribution. Indeed, Dharampalji was and still remains a guru for many of us assembled here today. And indeed, for many more outside this virtual space, and perhaps for generations to come. I'm quite overwhelmed by the response that our webathon has received, though in a way I'm not that surprised given Dharampalji's iconic status. My warmest welcome and gratitude to the assembled dignitaries, representatives of our national institutions of research and academic learning who are ideationally supporting our special webathon. To our today's speakers, first and foremost, to Venerable Samdong Rinpoche, who will be addressing us over video from Dharamshala, to Dr. Sundar Sarukai, our keynote speaker on the philosophy of science, 
to Professor Matai, our eminent Gandhian scholar, closely associated with the Gandhi Research Foundation. And last but not least, to Shri Pavan Gupta, Dharampalji's close associate during the last decade of his life. A most cordial welcome also to the gallery of eminent speakers for the 11 subsequent monthly sessions of our webathon and to all friends, associates and exemplary people present with us over Zoom and watching over YouTube. All those who are interested in hopefully taking forward Dharampalji's life's work. For that is the ultimate purpose of this webathon, which had to be spread out over a whole year to be able to do justice to his multidimensional of uh, transdisciplinary or rather metadisciplinary in character, for it transcends normative and conventional categories, yet represents a magnificent crystallization point for many of our concerns today in India and perhaps globally as well. When conceptualized by him in the 1960s and continuing for almost half a century, the blueprints he offered were certainly revolutionary, underscoring the importance of indigenous science and technology, education, governance, local communities and their economy, and also of reviving the traditional synergies in the intra-Asian world. But many of these issues pinpointed by him are even more relevant today and need to be tackled urgently to revitalize India. Hence the rationale for this webathon and why we are all here today. As a Renaissance man, my father and guru embodied for me when I was a teenager living in London, the quintessence of India in all its intriguing complexity, but above all as a source of inspiration experiencing so intimately and imminently my father's creative intellect, unstinting commitment and dedication, coupled with absolute integrity and indomitable courage, experiencing all this constituted for me the educational foundation that nourished me and continues to serve as a touchstone for guidance and emulation. No doubt, this holds true for many of his shishya assembled here today as well. And most of us who knew him well, appreciated his encyclopedic knowledge, which was heightened by his avid curiosity to understand unfamiliar and new developments, forever youthful in mind and spirit. And yet we were flabbergasted or simply astonished by his unassuming, humble manner and his preference for chatting with unpretentious people, housewives, gardeners, and villagers, as opposed to some westernized intellectuals, many of whom he dismissed as bogus. May this irreverent, no-nonsense, iconoclastic spirit along with his many other constructive virtues, act as a lodestar to guide and inspire us, even as we pay homage to his legacy this afternoon and in our year-long webathon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Gita Ji, uh, Professor Gita Dharampal, uh, for your wonderful and uh, very nice uh, and encouraging remarks and for reminding us again about the spirit of Dharampalji's life and work. I now invite Dr. Ram Sharma, the Director for Centre for Indic Studies, to give a warm welcome on behalf of the Centre for Indic Studies, Indus University and the world. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ankur. Thank you, Geetaji, for your wonderful remarks. Uh, first of all, on this auspicious occasion of Guru Purnima, I would like to begin by offering my humble pranam and respectful obeisance to Shri Dharampalji. He was a great guru who mentored and inspired hundreds of scholars, activists, thinkers in the deeper quest to understand what does it mean by being an Indian. 
on this occasion i would like to welcome our eminent and esteemed guests today professor geeta dharampal ji from grf dr sachidanand joshi ji member secretary ignca professor kumar ratnam ji member secretary ichr professor sachidanand mishra ji member secretary icpr and professor virendra kumar ji malhotra member secretary icssr i would like to thank all of them for providing ideational support for the series of webinars and i would also like to welcome our guest speakers today fifth samdong rinpoche ji dr sundar uh, sundar sarukai ji professor mp mathai ji and shri pavan gupta ji it is indeed an honor and privilege for us at center for indic studies to host this webathon on the birth centenary celebrations of shri dharampal ji with your august presence and support center for indic studies at indus university was established in 2015 with a stated objective of restoring the dharmic narrative of india it gives me immense pleasure to share with you all that the ideological foundation and inspiration behind the establishment of this center came from two great thinkers of the last century specifically post independent india one of those thinkers was of course shri dharampal ji whom we are remembering today and the second one was coincidentally his good friend shri ram sarup ji who laid the foundation of the well known publishing house voice of india without their intellectual legacy we could neither have begun this journey nor made whatever humble contribution we have made or are making in raising awareness about our civilizational understanding dhampal ji rightly diagnosed that we especially the educated indians collectively suffer from schizophrenia which eventually culminates in self alienation from our civilizational ethos and practices in fact he observed that self alienated indians are the product of deeply entrenched colonial policies and practices in our social educational and political institutions we have been raised on a pseudo intellectual diet of the colonial narrative of indians being backward illiterate superstitious and oppressed this narrative was propagated by colonizers to justify their rule in india essentially captured in their slogan of the white man's burden of civilizing or converting the heathens of india this narrative was so astutely crafted and propagated that we are still struggling to come out of its spell the most unfortunate part of this propaganda was that even after the political independence of india for 70 years now the psyche and manners of our intelligentsia and policy makers are still shaped by this colonial indoctrination as we all know dharampal ji played a very important role in dismantling the colonial narrative through this through a systematic research on pre colonial india on various civilizational issues for this deconstruction he collected evidence from the horse's mouth spending more than 3 decades on unearthing material held in various archives of india and britain the research material transformed himself as he re stated repeatedly however more than that it transformed indic seekers provided them orientation and filled them with zeal and enthusiasm to rediscover india or more importantly indianness his work was monumental in delegitimizing the colonial narrative his books the beautiful tree indian science and technology civil uh, civil disobedience and many more became a manual for those who want to rediscover india from indian perspective his intellectual journey became the stuff of legend he single handedly collected such a huge amount of material that it is now published in more than 10 volumes excluding various unpublished works of equal measure his disciples who carried forward his legacy have now become prominent thinkers and advisors guiding young seekers throughout india shri m d shrinivas ji dr B, j k bajaj ji pavan gupta ji banwari ji indumati ji kadgare ji the late rajiv dikshit ji and many more are contributing immensely in revitalizing india and he managed to do this all in my opinion because he first of all became the true disciple of his guru and this is important for today's occasion guru purnima also he diligently pursued his guru's work that is mahatma gandhi and completed his unfinished task at least in this sphere of challenging colonial narrative with indisputable facts he paid his tri uh, brilliant tribute to both of his gurus yes you heard it right 
he had two gurus mahatma gandhi and india his life long quest to understand india or indianness culminated in his publication of bhartiya chitt manas and kala and his tribute to gandhi ji reflects in his last work understanding gandhi it would have been a great turning point if our humanities departments specifically those who indulge in post colonial and subaltern studies would have taken notice of his works and used it to challenge the colonial narrative which is their stated goal as well unfortunately they ignored and overlooked it resulting in gross ignorance of his works in academia it is only by understanding and incorporating the monumental work of dharampal ji in our academia that we can liberate all of us from this hostile colonial narrative that is ceaselessly damaging india i would like to end this welcome address by quoting dharampal ji's clarion call to index seekers he said quote for every civilization there comes a time when the people of that civilization have to remind themselves of their fundamental civilization consciousness and their understanding of the universe and of time from the basis of that recollection of the past they then define the path of their future many civilizations of the world have undergone such self appraisal and self renewal at different times in our long history many times we must have engaged in this recollection and reassertion of the chitt and kal of india we need to undertake such an exploration into ourselves again unquote he clearly stated in one of his interviews that i am quoting him again the solid foundation for the task of our national reconstruction is a distal knowledge of how india over the centuries has responded to various challenges a wide and deep study of our history literature and traditional wisdom still needs to be done from the perspective of our society we are going to explore each of his monumental works in this year long webathon with experts who have either worked with him or taken forward his legacy i request all participants those who have joined us today to join us in this year long exploration of understanding india through shri dharampal ji's work reclaiming the indigenous perspective and solutions will help us in decolonizing ourselves and reintegrating indians with india i would like to thank i would like to again thank and pay my gratitude to all our esteemed guests and speakers who have joined and supported us on this auspicious occasion thank you thank you very much thank you uh, dr ram sharma for those uh, welcome remarks and for reminding us very Uh, briefly about dharampal ji's life and work and for summarizing his uh, wonderful work in a very very uh, concise manner i now invite uh, dr sachidanand joshi who is the member secretary of the indira gandhi national center for the arts to uh, give a wel- welcome address sir thank you namaskar good afternoon to all of you uh it gives me immense pleasure to be here in the august gathering of all the learned scholars and followers of respected dharampal ji on behalf of indira gandhi national center for the arts i welcome all who have associated who have joined this uh, uh, webinar and i congratulate center for indic studies indus university ahmedabad and gandhian research foundation jalgaon to organize this year long webathon and the program which has been already chalked out is a very very uh, deep rooted program giving insight to the entire work uh, of dharampal ji it is indeed uh, a moment of uh, relevance that we talk about dharampal ji in the moment when when we all are passing through a challenging time of pandemic we all are facing the uh, trend of new normal which is emerging very fast and we have seen sea changes in our lives patterns thinking thoughts and philosophy and ideology but the basic values basic ideology basic philosophy remains the same which has been taught time and again by our eminent scholars ancestors professor dharampal ji has been one of them and his teachings his writings would be the guiding factor for years to come i am sure that uh, this foundation and the university indic indic studies ahmedabad would be 
doing the deep study on the deliberations which are which would be taking place in this uh, webathon and we will be bringing out uh, publications based on this so that we can give this material to the generations which are coming and which would be learning to lead the life in a new normal era of the changed world at indira gandhi national center for the arts we have been doing this uh studies from indian perspective we have started a bharat vidya prayojana uh, the basic aim of this prayojana is to look at the indology from indian perspective and try to build a narrative which is based on our ethos philosophy and uh, historical background rather than following the narrative which has been developed and developed by the western philosophers in in past couple of years we also started a sanskriti samvad shrinkla where we discuss about the contribution of eminent persons thinkers who have guided the society in more than one way like dharampal ji in fact we intended to organize one such edition of sanskriti samvad shrinkla this year in the month of february but as we all know we were all were passing through a very bad phase of pandemic we did not venture it to do however we are committed to do a big function maybe in the month of february next year which would be exactly 100 years of dharampal ji uh, my honorable trust president sri ram bahadur rai ji and one of the trustees dr mahesh sharma who are, who were very closely associated with dharampal ji and they were they they in fact they are followers of dharampal ji in more than one way uh, we have spoken at length and we are trying to Uh, chalk out the program how we can celebrate the hundred years of Dharampal ji. I must congratulate Geeta ji for her uh, efforts. In fact, she has been the guiding principal behind this entire webathon. And I must also congratulate Sri Ram Sharma and others uh, who have been coordinating this seminar, uh, this webathon, uh, for the for the benefit of the uh, entire society. at indira gandhi national center for the arts uh, as i have told you we are committed and we would be doing whatever is expected from our side i have seen the panel of uh, panelists who have who have been associated and who would be delivering their lectures i am sure that they would be of immense importance and relevance and all those if documented properly would be would be some kind of a new uh, new geeta or new new uh, title new granth for the years to come how the society should behave how india should develop uh, i will not take much of time because others uh, my as other associate institutions like indian council of social science research uh, ichr icpr all member secretaries honorable member secretaries are there on the panel uh, all we all together can really build an atmosphere throughout this year only my humble submission would be uh, that this should not only be limited to the Uh, scholars above 50 i think the real task and that is an uphill task to take dharampal ji to the people below 30 of india because they would be the india for tomorrow and if we can take dharampal ji to the to the people below 30 in india i think that would be a great success how we can achieve that is 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 a is a task and is a, is an exercise for which we have to sit separately and design some programs this should not be only limited to the uh, virtual platform where few people come and discuss and go but this should also go to the grassroots level of the society that was the dream of the rampal ji i know that uh, that dream would come true if we all come together and think in a, on a different level uh, i hope that uh, whenever i am required uh, for i will be able to contribute whatever little i can do thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share my views namaskar thank you sir for your kind words of appreciation for giving us uh, so much ideational and ideological support and for telling us about the work that you have been doing at indira gandhi national center for the arts and how your center plans to take forward the legacy of sri dharampal ji it's very encouraging to know all these things uh I now in I will now invite Professor Sachidanand Mishra from the Indian Council of uh, Philosophical Research to say a few words. Sir. Thank you. Namaste. 
so this is fortunate to be part of this uh, group of scholars uh, to this uh, introductory session of this webithon and as i see that many institutes are organizing this they are in support of this program and actually icpr iccssr ichr gandhi gandhi research uh, foundation jalgaon ingc and indus university all these are in um, in collaboration to organize to hold the uh, one year program webithon on the contribution of dharampal ji this is a wonderful idea because uh, as i see what uh, contributions dharampal ji has provided uh, they are so many they are related to so many fields that one institute cannot do justice to the uh, thoughts of dharampal ji so this is a very good uh, idea to organize a one year program uh, with uh, collaboration with all these institutes icpr iccssr and so on and it is also very good to see that uh, the theme of this webithon uh, is actually revitalizing india because uh, now we are reaching to 75 years of our freedom but actually uh, mentally we are not uh, free from those uh, impressions uh, which are uh, put uh, on our minds and uh, it needs some time and actually these scholars like dharampal ji who contributed and who uh, fought the battle on this ground and they they presented the idea of india from the inside of indian culture from inside of india and how the india should be understood how the indian history should be understood how the indian philosophy should be understood the uh, dharampal ji has guided and how uh, the history of science and technology of india should be developed uh, understood because uh, there are so many issues uh, in related to this idea and uh, Uh, because we were colonized therefore uh, um, it was uh, uh, assumed that uh, we didn't have such progress and now it is very clear that if we study and go through the descriptions provided by the western scholars it will be wrong to go to the to the way so that is a very important thing and very necessary to to decolonize our minds and our mindset and in this regard um, professor dharampal ji's contribution is very important and only going through the direction following the directions dharampal ji has provided and uh, uh, opening our minds and uh, rediscovering the true self in india that was actually the goal of dharampal ji we can decolonize indian minds and that will be done in this year i i feel fortunate to welcome all the scholars which are present here and the theme of this uh, today's talk is introduction to dharampal dharampal ji's contribution and uh, its relevance for the present and uh, there are many scholars that like dr sundar sarukkai and uh, professor mp mathai and also professor geeta dharampal ji mr pawan gupta and there are so many other scholars like professor dr professor sambang rinpoche ji so these scholars uh, these visionaries are there and they will guide us and also they give some uh, in light uh, how to discover the soul of india and how to place the india's progress in the light of uh, present development present scenario that will be a very wonderful idea and uh, i welcome all these scholars professor geeta dharampal ji is here i welcome you all you madam uh, dr uh, uh, ankur uh, kakkad is here 
प्रोफेसर सच्चिदानंद जोशी जी हियर प्रोफेसर वीरेंद्र कुमार मल्होत्रा जी हियर डॉक्टर श्री सामदांग रिनपोचे जी आदरणीय सामदांग रिनपोचे जी जी हियर आई वेलकम यू ऑल एंड आल्सो आई कांग्रेचुलेट डॉक्टर राम शर्मा जी हु कंसीव्ड दिस आइडिया एंड हु इनवाइटेड ऑल अस ऑल ऑफ अस टू गिव आइडियेशनल सपोर्ट and uh, in the form of thinking and uh, so i congratulate this uh, in this university also and other scholars who are present here and we think that uh, this year will be this, this will be a very fruitful dialogue very fruitful seminars baby uh, than will be this will be there so i congratulate and without speaking too much i um, Uh, stop here thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to welcome uh, you all thank you thank you sir thank you for saying such wonderful words for telling us about the reminding us about the relevance of dharampal ji's work and about uh, the need to decolonize india uh, based on on the work of dharampal ji and for giving us and providing us ideational support from the indian council of philosophical research uh now i invite professor virender kumar malhotra ji from the indian council of social science research to say a few words sir thank you uh, <clears throat> thank you dr ankur kakkar and thanks to dr ram sharma ji also uh, who has been one of the key forces behind organizing this program uh, i'm also thankful to professor geeta dharampal uh, with whom uh indian council of social science research has been associated for last 3 to 4 years in fact when she was there in germany she was uh, there to come to india we were discussing all these issues and when she settled in india then also we talked of certain projects that she very happily undertook uh in collaboration with indian council of social science research uh, on this occasion i intend to put on record that icssr is coming out with a series i mean two known series understanding india and indian thinkers indian thinkers is coming in two volumes and we are already dedicating three papers on shri dharampal ji so that is uh, as i understand that center for indic studies definitely has taken it uh, as a mission that they would be holding year long webinars called webthon uh for revitalization of india and that would culminate into the 100 years of shri dharampal ji uh we all know that dharampal ji was a gandhian thinker a pioneering historian and a political philosopher also and the kind of works that he uh, handled almost single handedly uh and the kind of libraries that he visited to have uh, inputs from the british sources itself and sources which ever existed then uh, the libraries key libraries that he visited during those periods included british indian archival material lost in british library indian office library in london uh, bodleian library in oxford and national library of scotland edinburgh uh i very briefly would like to mention few of his works and they will speak about uh, him more than we intend to speak about him in fact the works include the beautiful tree indigenous indian education in the 18th century published in 19 in 18 1983 18, indian science and technology in the 18th century in 1971 and civil disobedience and indian tradition in 1971 and there there are two more works to which i would like to make a reference the british origin of cow slaughter in india with some british documents in the anti kind killing movement 1880 to 1894 and understanding gandhi which got published in 2003 when we talk of all these works together there is one common thing that comes to our understanding uh, as we all know that shri dharampal ji was trying to perhaps argue to the best of his ability rigor and scholarship that india has traditionally historically and civilizationally 
constituted a scientific society. That's one thing. Secondly, whatever distortions in Indian system of education, they came into existence, they came, they started to appear only uh, with the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, I'm amazed his expression that when he says that civil disobedience in the country, I mean, a country which was said to be less literate, less educated, less civilized by the British uh, thinkers and authors, they could think in those times of movements like civil disobedience, nonviolent movement, right? So a society which was perhaps at the epitome of being civilized in those senses of the word could dream or could think of organizing such movements in this manner. Uh, his comparison with Donald F. Lash's monumental series entitled Asia in the Making of Europe, uh, published in 1965, and another work, uh, his Indian Science and Technology, uh, which was then compared with Joseph Nidham's multi-volume work on Chinese science and civilization published in 1954. They definitely remind us of the fact that, that India has always been, uh, we being perhaps uh, the, the wisest and the oldest civilization. The civilization that is oldest has to be the wisest also somewhere. Uh, so we need to understand that why we have existed for so long and why we have successfully led the world also for so long also. Uh, Asia in the making of Europe, I think it's a significant work. It establishes beyond doubt and with which Dharampalji's comparison is done. It is, it is one such monumental work which definitely throws a light that whole of Europe could come into existence in terms of its scientificism only because it, it got basic understanding of the existing scientific phenomena in the world only from Asia. And very study of Chinese science and civilization, two civilizations have been most studied in the world. And they include uh, China and India. Uh, let, me, let me say and put on record that India's independence, uh, perhaps politically and to some extent could have been complete but it remained incomplete and Dharampalji continued with the incomplete works even in post-independence period. Uh, when I look at his associates with whom he worked for refugee rehabilitation, uh, Dr. Ram Manohar Loya, or in cooperative movement with L.C. Jain, worked for Mahatma Gandhi's Gram Swaraj, Panchayati Raj we know, shall remain ever important issue in this country until uh, the people at the bottom are fully empowered, be that in political sense, be that in economic sense. And uh, the way he participated and tried to document NGOs and civil society organization, I would make a particular reference to the period 1958 to 1964 where we see a lot many writings of him focusing on the role of NGOs and civil society organization. I think this is one such area where one needs to take forward the kind of uh, civil society organization and NGOs and human or social capital that has existed in the country. One needs to document that. And the, the, the force with which he argued that in India, women were never uh, discriminated there, they were having their own roles and at the highest points in the society in educational, social, cultural, and religious institution. I need not name the institution uh, because time uh, for, all, for all of us is too short. I'm very happy to see that India has started to talk about knowledge heritage now. Uh, uh, let me again, for the interest of the very learned audience here, put on record that in the recent past, in our dialogue with UN and UNESCO-like organization, we have also, I, ICSSR has also taken a stand that our knowledge tradition or knowledge heritage has also to be made a part of intangible heritage of the world. And uh, 
I'm very happy to notice that on this occasion, that Center for Indic Studies has taken uh, this initiative and we would be concentrating on indigenous studies and subjects that that and that alone is the way we can afford or we can think of decolonizing our own minds in fact, because we need to get rid of our decolonization first before we talk of any nation or a society or a civilization even. So with these words, uh, we have very deep engagement with Gita Dharampalji right now and the Social Science Subcommission of the UNESCO, uh, which ICSSR is chairing, Gita Ji is very much uh, an active member of that. With these words, I will stop here itself. I wish uh, this webathon a great success over uh, next one year and uh, we'll see to it that in whatever possible ways we could contribute towards that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your warm wishes and for your uh, wonderful support and unstinting support, ideationally, ideologically, and uh, in various ways. Uh, and also for summarizing and telling us about the importance of knowledge systems for decolonization. I think it's very, it's a great initiative, and I congratulate the ICSSR on doing great work in this on this front. I now invite Professor K. Ratnamji from the Indian Council of Historical Research to say a few words, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ankurji. Undoubtedly, it's a wonderful occasion and a wonderful event organized by the Indus University and the Center of Indus Studies, the work century of the Dharampalji. A few days back, I, when I was in Gujarat, I discussed so many things, Dr. Ram Sharma, about the programs and the working of the institution, etc. I am very happy to share here that we are you are doing such a tremendous work in the field of Indian history, literature, and culture, etc. In that same perspective, you have organized such an event, it is very relevant in the present time when we are, as rightly remarked by Professor Sachidanan Joshi ji, when we are celebrating 75th anniversary of, of the, our independence. The question is that whether we have got the independence or the power of transfer, it is a very important question to think over it in the last 75 years was not yet decided whether we have fully independent or we have received only the transfer of power. In this regard, the historian, philosophers, scholars like Dharampalji as not at their recognitions as they must be put in the national or international canvas. I want also to share it that we have organized a national seminar in BHU in October 18 for the first time. It was covered by all the newspapers, channels and media on the basis of the philosophy of Dharampalji. I think that was a, that may be a good concept note for this program also, the proceedings of that uh, seminar, as Dr. Ramji is very much known this fact. I won't want to repeat the works of the Dharampalji. He was undoubtedly a historian, and as for the, his science and technological history contribution, we have taken up as a project in ICHR. We have completed the second volume is coming very soon. And we are also organizing several seminars on Dharampalji. One seminar was organized a few months back in Bhopal in the Dharampalji Shodh Sansthan with the collaboration. The question is that what history we are teaching what is the real history of India on which your institution is very much serious about it. 
distortion of history based in from the last more than decades but what we have done in this regard i want to say that the ichr is doing in that perspective very well we are to designing two volumes on this occasion one is on the distortion of the history the another the comprehensive history of bharat which will start from the idea of bharat so in that way much work we have to done in this way and particularly when the the question of decolonizing of the mindset as the professor melotra and the sachidanand ji quoted here is very important so in this regard you are doing very well and uh, this webinar or this uh, this lecture series will be very fruitful and the results and the proceedings of this webinar will clear so many things in the philosophical field in the historical field and in the educational system too professor melotra referred so many works of the dhampal ji undoubtedly they are the very meritorious work and that must be come in the public domain not only in the for the academician or the researcher they are very important for the point of view of the country so i hope that the all the issues will be discussed in this uh, lecture series and the learned scholars under the guidance of sister uh, geeta ji will be fruitful for the nation and the society i wish for the grand success and congratulate to the organizing committee and the organizers and uh, on behalf of my institution indian council of historical research on behalf of the all the mem members of the council i congratulate you and i assure you to support at every level as the matter of the publication the proceedings or any support you will need i will be always happy to serve this such a noble work thank you very much thank you sir thank you so much for your kind words and for your warm support that you have been offering us and for your kind words of appreciation and for telling us about the importance of historical narratives in the role of decolonizing india thank you sir uh, i now i'll now play out a special video address by the fifth samdong rimpo cheji so i'll share my screen now so that you can see that special video address that the samdong rimpo cheji has recorded for us परमाधरणीय डॉक्टर गीता धर्मपाल जी और समस्त सहभागी लोगों को मैं अभिवादन करता हूँ सेंटर फॉर इंडिक स्टडीज और इंडस विश्वविद्यालय गांधी रिसर्च फाउंडेशन के सम्मिलित तत्वावधान में श्री धर्मपाल जी की जन्म क्षति मनाने के कार्यक्रम संयोजित किया है बहुत खुश हुए इसको जान कर के मैं डॉक्टर गीता जी का आभार मानता हूँ जिन्होंने मुझे भी इसमें भाग लेने के अवसर प्रदान किया श्री धर्मपाल जी एक ऐसा विशेष व्यक्ति रहे हैं जो स्वाधीन भारत में भारत की परंपराओं को पश्चिम भारतीय विद्याओं को और पश्चिम भारतीय संस्कृति को 
पुनर्जीवित और पुनः स्थापित करने के लिए एक विशेष प्रकार की योगदान प्रदान किया है सभी लोगों को विदित है कि आर्यवर्त भारतवर्ष एक ऐसा संपूर्ण विश्व में भूभाग रहा है जो एक और हिमालय पर्वतों की श्रृंखला की और से प्रारंभ होकर की हिंद महासागर तक फैले हुए इस देश ने प्राचीनतम सभ्यताओं की स्रोत रहा है धर्म दर्शन कला संस्कृति के अनेक परंपराएं इस भूभाग में उद्गम हुआ अनेक ऋषि मुनि और प्रबुद्ध लोगों का जन्म हुआ अंगने धर्म दर्शन की परंपराओं का उदय हुआ जिससे संपूर्ण विश्व में एक ज्ञान की विद्या की प्रकाश प्रसारित हुआ जिस कारण सही माने में भारतवर्ष को जगत गुरु की संजय दिया गया है ये कोई अतिशय युक्ति नहीं थे ये यथार्थ में सही बात थे और हजारों वर्ष तक इन परंपराओं का संवर्धन संरक्षण विकास होता रहा जिससे संपूर्ण जगत को अत्यधिक लाभ निवित हुआ परंतु कालांतर में आधुनिक के काल के प्रारंभ से ही भारतवर्ष विदेशों की अकमानों से और बाहर से आए हुए राजनीतिक या सैनिक शादियों के कारण पराधीन राजनीतिक दृष्टि से और अन्य अन्य दूसरे दृष्टिकोण से भी पराधीन रहा विभिन्न शासकों के माध्यम से जिसके कारण भारत की परंपरा और विद्या और ज्ञान की हरास हुए उन हरासों के इतिहास को देखें तो प्रारंभ में जो विदेश शासन शासकों के माध्यम से राजनीतिक के दमन के अतिरिक्त सांस्कृतिक और दर्शनिक के परंपराओं का विशेष रूप से सुनियोजित ढंग से समाप्त करने की चेष्टा नहीं हुए परंतु बाद में ब्रिटिश शासन के समय में जब तक भारतीय शैक्षणिक संस्थाएं और सांस्कृतिक परंपराएं दार्शनिक परंपराएं को परंपराओं को नष्ट नहीं किया जाए तब तक ब्रिटानी शासन स्थायी रूप से रह नहीं सकेंगे इस तथ्य को देखते हुए आधुनिक शिक्षा प्रणाली का एक कार्यक्रम परामर्श है ऐसा मुझे अनुभूति हुआ और उसके पश्चात बहुत अधिक के समय उनके साथ संसर्ग करने की और मिलने जुलने का अवसर नहीं मिला लेकिन जब जब दर्शन करने का अवसर मिला तो मैं उस अवसर को अवश्य लाभ उठाने के प्रयास करते थे और उन्होंने उनसे बहुत कुछ हमने सीखा उनको भी प्राचीन भारतीय विद्याओं के प्रति प्राचीन भारतीय कलाओं के प्रति बहुत रुचि थे जैसा अठारह महाविद्या स्थान और चौंसठ कलाएं जो प्राचीन भारत की विशेषताएं थे उसका नाम भी अभी जीवित नहीं थे संपूर्ण रूप से तो उन्होंने मुझे कहा कि बौद्ध सूत्रों से 
उन सारे विद्याओं की और कलाओं की नाम और विवरण निकाल करके उनको दिया जाए मैंने ललित बिस्तर सूत्र और अभिनिष्कम सूत्र वगैरह में विनित वगैरह में जो वर्णित जो हैं और रंग किया हुआ चौंसठ कलाओं की नाम और उसके विवरण और अठारह या दस या पाँच विद्या स्थानों के नाम वगैरह निकाल करके मैंने उनको प्रेषित किया था उनके ऊपर वो कुछ काम कर रहे थे लेकिन बाद में बहुत समय था कि वो काम करने का अवसर नहीं मिला तो उसका क्या परिणाम हुआ मुझे मालूम नहीं था लेकिन उन्होंने बहुत मौलिक काम जैसा मैंने कहा कि एक भारतीयता के मूल चित्र की आवश्यकता होते हैं बहुत कम लोगों में होता है मूल चित्र इसलिए कठिन हो जाता है जो आधुनिक के एजुकेशन है वो एक प्रकार से मनुष्य के मानसिकता को चित्तवृत्ति को बर्निंग कर देते हैं वो आधुनिकता के जो एक प्रकार के अंधविश्वास होता है साइंस के माध्यम से जो अंधविश्वास लोगों में उत्पन्न किया जाता है वो अपने आप में अंधविश्वास ना हो करके एक बहुत तार्किक दृष्टिकोण हैं ऐसा अंधविश्वास हो जाता है और उस कारण लोगों की मूल चित्त वृत्ति समाप्त हो जाता है तो उसको संरचित करने वाला बहुत कम लोग थे तो जिसमें मैं धर्मपाल जी की विशेष योगदान इस देश के लिए संपूर्ण मानव के लिए संपूर्ण जगत के लिए उनका यही जो अपने मूल चित्त को संरचित रख करके उस दृष्टिकोण से सब चीज़ को आधुनिक शिक्षा के लाभ लेते हुए भी आधुनिक एजुकेशन के लाभ लेते हुए भी उन्हें अपने परंपरा को नहीं छोड़ा और परंपरा को समझने में कोई त्रुटि नहीं हुए ये उनकी बहुत विशेषता थे और खास विशेष रूप से उनके आने की जो रचनाएं हैं वो सब मौन की रचनाएँ हैं और बहुत ही वर्तमान परिस्थिति में विशेष रूप से भविष्य के मानव हित के लिए वो सब बहुत ही प्रासंगिक और उपयोगी रचनाएं थे तो उन रचनाओं में से जो दो रचनाएं हैं मेरे लिए बहुत विशेष रहा है द ब्यूटफुल ट्री अठारहवें शतविधि में लगभग अंत हो रहा था लेकिन तभी भारतीय शीशा परंपरा भारतीय विद्याओं की परंपरा क्या था उसको बहुत ही परमाणिक के शोध के माध्यम से गांधी जी के वक्तव्य को प्रमाणिक करने के लिए उन्होंने एक महाग्रंथ रचना किया वो एक विशेष उनकी योगदान मैं ऐसा मानता हूँ और उससे भी महत्वपूर्ण द अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ गांधी जैसा मैंने पहले निवेदन किया है गांधी जी को समझने वाले बहुत कम लोग थे उनके निकट से जो वो लोग भी गांधी जी से सहमत होते थे गांधी जी के नेतृत्व को मानते थे गांधी जी के उपदेशों को मान करके उनके द्वारा बनाए गए कार्यक्रमों में भाग लेते थे लेकिन उसकी मूल पृष्ठभूमि किस प्रकार की दार्शनिक आधार पर उन कार्यों को स्थापित किया गया है वो नहीं जानते थे उसको जानने के लिए बहुत ही गंभीर और बहुत ही सरल शब्दों में गंभीर अर्थ को सरल शब्दों में बताने के धर्मपाल जी ने प्रयास किया है उससे मुझे बहुत लाभ हुआ तो ये दो ग्रंथ उनके सारे ग्रंथों में सब ग्रंथ एक ही जैसे महत्वपूर्ण और प्रासंगिक विशेष रूप से आने वाले समय के लिए संपूर्ण मानव हित के लिए बहुत अधिक प्रासंगिक ग्रंथियाँ हैं उनको आने वाले पीढ़ी अध्ययन करेंगे और उससे बहुत कुछ लाभ उठाएंगे ऐसा मैं मानता हूँ और उनकी जन्म क्षति और वो भी उनकी विचारों से उनकी रचनाओं से रचनाओं के ऊपर अनुशीलन करते हुए 
जो नामसा जी एक वर्ष पर्यंत मनाने के आयोजन आप लोगों ने किया है ये बहुत ही अच्छे काम है ये सफल हो और इसमें संलग्न जितना भी संस्थाएं हैं और व्यक्ति लोग हैं उन सबको मैं साधुवाद देता हूँ और मैं प्रयास करूँगा भविष्य के कार्यक्रमों में भी अगर संभव हो तो मैं भी सहभागी रहूँ और ये सारे काम सुचारू रूप से संपन्न हो और जिससे धर्मपाल जी की योगदान को पुनः सब लोगों के पास पहुंचने के एक निमित्त बने और जिससे भारत की और संपूर्ण जगत की कल्याण सिद्ध हो ऐसा मेरे शुभकामना है और आज ये प्रथम उनके जन्म शती की कार्यक्रमों में जो एक प्रकार से उद्घाटन सत्र हैं इसमें मुझे भाग लेने के अवसर मिला मैं अपने को सौभाग्य समझता हूँ गीता जी को पुनः मैं धन्यवाद देता हूँ और ये सारे कार्यक्रम सफल हो ऐसा मेरे शुभकामना और तिरातन से प्रार्थना करता हूँ जय जगत so that was a brief and warm welcome address from the fifth sandong rinpoche ji i hope that you are all able to hear it and uh, even though the volume may be slightly low because of the recording quality i guess but i think it was still quite audible i uh, now request dr san sundar sarukai ji to give his keynote address thank you sir thank you uh, dr kakkar um it's a great pleasure and honor to give this talk as part of this very important celebration of dharampal ji's work i am very grateful to professor geeta dharampal who when she contacted me about the possibility of talking in this uh, occasion <clears throat> and i was um, immediately i immediately agreed because of many reasons one um, the stature of the scholar or the kind of person he was and also because much of the work uh, which we have done earlier have been influenced to a great extent by shri taram balji's work and more important um, some of us have always been thinking about how to convert that kind of important insights into many aspects of not just society and culture but also on aspects of science and technology within contemporary situation earlier somebody remarked that we should be uh, getting more young people uh, to or, you know understand uh, professor dharam pal's work and so on and uh, to us it is a very important uh, part of our own engagement with his ideas that we find the language to communicate the relevance of these kinds of reflections so i'm really grateful to uh, professor geeta darampal and all of you who have organized this uh, event um i hope there will be no uh, intervention uh, you know technological problems while i do this i'm on the west coast and there's as many of you would have heard in, in karnataka there's been massive rains and i'm hoping um we will be able to sustain this but if there is a problem there's still very heavy rains here i will just turn off the video and then continue um yeah so i want to begin with a very simple quiet point that uh, dharampal ji's work has had significant influence and to take one step beyond what most of you have spoken about so far the influence is not just about interpreting india and interpreting the past of india but also about the notion of science and technology to me that's an extremely important uh insight which comes which is catalyzed by uh, professor dharam pal's work and so i'm going to stick to that specific point to try and show you how that is integrated with all the work that he has done and that it is not a stand alone point at all now interestingly my own introduction uh, to uh, dharam pal ji's work came when i uh, joined the national institute of advanced studies in bangalore which many of you might know was an institute which just the last institute started by jrd tata but uh, of the founding director was uh, dr raja ramanna the well known indian scientist so when i joined nias um you know i was surrounded by it was a very small institute 
we had people like Dr. Ramana and Professor um, C. V. Sundaram, uh, who were uh, very well known scientists who had moved away from their practice of everyday science into looking at various other aspects of science. In particular, uh, Dr. Ramana well, at that time was very interested in Buddhist philosophy and um, he, he did write some very interesting stuff about the way in invoking the ideas of Buddhist philosophy in understanding contemporary physics. Uh, Professor Sivi Sundaram was a metallurgist who came from a very strong technology background. He was the previous director of the Kalpakam Nuclear Institute, um, the um, you know um, um, the DAE lab in uh, Kalpakam, uh, and he had he was beginning to think about questions of uh, technology. So when I joined that institute. I had the occasion to be able to start getting to be influenced and talk to them about questions of what constitutes ideas of Indian science and Indian technology. And the big shift for me in my own engagement with this particular problem, uh, considering that my primary um, interest was and my work research interest is in philosophy of science. Uh, but very ironically, the, my uh, shift into this program came through an introduction to Professor Dharampal's work through Claude Alvarez's book, which many of you know, uh, the well known book Decolonizing History. Now, through Decolonizing History, we were, uh, I, I ended up looking at uh, Dharampalji's work and we found that there was a completely different framework to actually try and understand what it meant to talk about science and technology. So again, the question is not about Indian science and technology, but opening up the spaces to talk about science and technology, given the fact that the definitions of science and technology were restricted, were in many times utilitarian or many times very idealized. Now it so happened that um, um, after uh, Dr. Ramanam, uh, we had a very another very well known scientist who was deeply interested in the history of science, Professor Rodham Narsimha, uh, who unfortunately passed away a few months back. Um, he uh, was a very well known scientist, but he was also an extremely uh, keen, um, you know, reader of uh, student of history of science and in particular history of Indian science. So. Uh, it was within this um, kind of a constellation of people who came to the question of history in a very similar way to how Dharampalji came to the question of history in trying to understand the nature of science and technology, particularly in the Indian context. But since my interest was again in the context of philosophy of science, I will just list uh, you know, ways in which I uh, was deeply influenced by how Dharampalji's work uh, if, uh, particularly his, uh, the, the, his very important work on Indian science and technology in the 18th century, um, published exactly 50 years back in 1971, how it actually helps us understand certain questions of science and technology as practiced in India today. So the first, uh, to me, the great learning from looking at Dharampalji's work um, along with uh, very important work, for, of course, by Claude Alvarez and also by people like Michael Adas, um, the very famous book on machines as the measure of men, was to recognize that it is impossible to re meaningfully talk of a philosophy of science. By philosophy of science, I mean an attempt to understand the foundational aspects of what science is. Um, that it is impossible to understand a meaningful approach to philosophy of science without factoring history of science. And my shift, uh, you know, for in my own studies in philosophy, I had never engaged with the question of history. And it is due to the Rampalji's influence that I started looking at the questions of history as being integral to any question of philosophy in a very important sense. And in this particular case, um, uh, Dharampalji's work on science and technology, although looking at British archives, looking at the ways in which, um, you know, narratives of science and technology are constructed by a colonial administration for reasons of power and exploitation and so on, uh, which is well known and which many of all of you are well versed in that a very important influential work by Dharampalji. But when I looked at it, it actually points uh, to a very important aspect of how to actually study cultural practices of science and technology, which is that science and technology is not independent of certain cultural practices and that it cannot be reduced to just certain what we would call as, you know, epistemological essence, claims of 
this knowledge or that knowledge. The practice of science in its social moorings of science, in its social egalitarianism which arises in the kinds of examples which are spoken uh, in many of the examples discussed by Dharampalji and later workers who worked on very similar topics in building a history of science, it shows the co social complexity of the idea of science and the impossibility of defining science without the social complexity. In a sense to me, Dharampalji's work predates, uh, becomes very important hallmark of what is eventually comes to be called as science and technology studies around the world. A very important discipline today, practiced all over the world with various levels of sophistication. Uh, but in India, of course, we have had a very serious resistance to establishment of any uh, decent science and technology, professionalized science and technology uh, programs. But in what uh, Dharampalji was doing, to me, it was not just a question of history of science, that there was the possibility of understanding science through this ma la ma larger narrative, which includes history, sociology, politics, and practices common everyday practices of people in the production of knowledge. Now, what is ironic is much of this, which becomes part of what STS, Science and Technology Studies does later in the West and across the world is in, uh, I would say in many sense predated in Dharampalji's work. But one has to really pull that out, try and show these connections. But uh, Science and Technology Studies continue to remain um, I would say to use um, least offensive term, I would just say continue to remain indifferent or ignorant of work of such seminal work such as uh, Professor Dharampal. And, um, you know, as recent a book, um, the, the, the STS uh, Society, a very important society for science and technology studies, the Triple S Society, uh, publishes a handbook called the STS Handbook, a very influential handbook, uh, a huge volume. Uh, which brings the scholars from around the world uh, to talk about various issues in science and technology studies. And the latest one, which is just a couple of years back, was uh, one which began with the, the, with the editors start making the point that they wanted to be, uh, have more diversity, they wanted to include Asia and Africa more in this particular um, uh, handbook. And yet, if you open the handbook and go through the contents, it's only about 5% of papers uh, of, uh, of all the chapters which are published come from authors who are situated outside the dominant West. In other words, although the beginnings of trying to understand science and technology studies in the rubric of multidisciplinary approach through history, sociology, political science, etc., was available in the works of Dharampalji, STS studies globally continues this complete, uh, you know, as I said, uh, ignorance or, um, you know, which whatever, I, I really don't know how to articulate this indifference towards uh, drawing upon this uh, very important work. At the same time, in recent time, there has been quite an influential set of uh, debates and discussions between historians of science and philosophers of science. ISIS, the one of the most influential uh, journals in history of science uh, also published, for example, um, a, a set of special papers talking about the relationship between history of science and philosophy of science. Now, even in these kind of approaches, there seems to be a complete lack of understanding of how to draw upon the history of science produced by people like Dharampal. Now, there are two ways of responding to this question. <coughs> One is to say, well, this is the problem of colonialism, and many of you um, talked about it, and that's true. I mean, that's, uh, I would say, a very obvious state uh, given fact, and we have to find ways to engage with that question. But today, in the remaining few minutes, what I want to also point out, uh, so as not to reduce everything that Dharampalji uh, did to just problems of colonialism, is to also highlight another problem. And this other problem is that there is a genuine problem in evaluating and reading the material produced as part of this history of science. I'll just give you some simple examples to illustrate what I'm trying to say. In other words, one of the reasons why there is a genuine um, you know, disconnect between making sense of the accounts of the historical, um, historical um, <coughs> you know, data on the on scientific practice in Indian society, ancient and medieval, by modern scholars. One is of course colonialism and the other is that 
there is a difficulty in understanding the conceptual foundations <coughs> I'm sorry uh, behind this empirical account so what this what i mean by this is this and i'm saying for those of us who want to take darampalji's work in uh, in the contemporary world try and teach this relevance of it to our students we have to engage with this question in other words what it means is we need to find a framework to shift from the kinds of narratives of histories of science that we know about what people did when like for example the kinds of so called developments in ancient india etc in the framework of a conceptual schema which we understand today so i'll give you uh, the problems with this and also potential solutions and end with this so one the fact that uh, a large amount of this empirical um, empirical discussion and the setting out of this uh, very rich history of uh, indian science and technology um, and the fact that it was being ignored by much of the historians of science um, much of uh, you know the global history of science etc can be seen as one that this kind of history was being tolerated at the most or it was completely rejected in full or dismissed and that's the range of things you may have um in our own work with uh, historians of science uh, globally very important influential historians of science uh, when i got a group of them from canada to come to uh, india to do have a discussion on this um you know they would say at the most that well all these points about uh, science and technology in india are interesting but we won't say anything about it so then i asked them would you go teach this in your classes after all if you if you think that these are reasonable then would it become part of your textbook because it's part of the history of science and then they would still say no uh, we don't know enough about it we don't want to say anything about it so it becomes it becomes worse it becomes worse than rejection with the explicit colonialism for example what what happens to this history of science material is uh, they just become indifferent to it it is not uh, cited it does not circulate within the way history of science understands itself nor uh, do these examples go to construct a meaningful definition of what science is so the other kind of extreme which i have seen is to say well um let me accept that all these uh, uh, questions about science and technology which have been given by these historians for, by from these archival work by people like darampal ji etc let's accept those things and then they would say so what so what what do you want us to do about this so let's say yes we had some of the greatest ideas of uh, modern metallurgy which are present in ancient indian practices you had the famous example of steel the ukku uh, for production you had the alloys one of the greatest kinds of alloy productions as a society, social process uh, the modes of production are very important to it there's a materiality of production i mean you can see why this is such a very rich material for historians to look at and interpret this particular kind of a text but when you look at it in the context of philosophy of science the question is yes they are maybe they did all that but so what there are two answers to this one comes from the colonial discourse which we which said well these people produced all these kinds of questions of uh, you know uh, metallurgical product in chemistry in medicine etc uh, darampal ji for example talks about the smallpox example and so on and in astronomy i mean there are you know many many examples and we have seen some of the best uh, work by professor m d srinivas and his colleagues on indian mathematics very rich uh, you know very exciting material for us to uh, think and uh, look at it Uh, from both the historical and the philosophical sense but still the the question is the the burden of answering the so what does fall upon us and that is not just a question of a nation or civilization that's an intellectual question of what it is to define science and technology how do i learn to draw upon this material to say something meaningful about alternate practices of science and technology about an alternate world view of science and technology to me that's one of the greatest contributions by darampal ji in darampal ji's work which is it is not just about giving a, a kind of a historical account or giving you some instances of what people had done earlier but of making us understand that 
these kinds of practices are integral to the lived experience and the lived practices of a functioning society and that therefore any notions of your definitions of science and technology has to start from that level the the the, the reaction of so what has gone so deep today that e today it is impossible to talk about certain kinds of um, many of these practices um, you know because there is an absolute incommensurability of terms which operates in the in, in this discourse two classic examples i can give you one is the example of ayurveda and again i'm sure much of you many of you uh, know this very well there are very good scholars of uh, ayurveda here and i don't want to say anything more and i know uh, professor darshan shankar is also speaking later on in this webathon uh, but I, the, the the kind of prejudice which exists in our response to the question of ayurveda is that you can talk about ayurveda as giving us certain kind of empirical accounts of certain medicines giving us certain kinds of uh, uh, descriptions of particular ways but what people have uh, the problem people have is when you talk about ayurveda as a quote unquote science or as a knowledge system and it has gone so deep that i am right now in a midst of a um, you know a debate or a fight if you like with isis this uh, uh, you know the most highly rated history of science journal published from the us in uh, regarding a paper which was published by a person in one of the sister journals called osiris where he begins by pointing out that uh, you know i i think that's it's actually a very um, nasty attack on ayurvedic people ayurvedic physicians and uh, people who talk about ayurveda uh, in terms of knowledge systems and for him if uh, you invoke the term knowledge system vis a vis ayurveda then you are betraying various things ranging from nationalism to right wing etc etc so i wrote to their isis editors and i said uh, look this is slander and uh, there, there is no way in which you should be publishing and legitimizing such um, you know abusive terms with respect to a system in which you have no stake in and which you have no knowledge about and you know it's been going on but dices editors um, keep telling me that this is part of uh, academic freedom and people can criticize people the way they want and they do not seem to understand the fact that they are making a judgment on uh, ayurvedic um, you know um, scholars and physicians who talk about it in terms of knowledge that uh, they, what they are doing constitutes slander There, there are other very good examples. I'll give you one more example of the way in which um, history of science is engaged with the question of um, meditation, research in meditation. You know, I've been for a long time been part of uh, various uh, workshops and conferences in uh, Buddhism, uh, particularly because of the great interest among the Buddhist in the Buddhist community and particularly the Dalai Lama on Buddhism and science. So there was a meeting in Sarnath um, when Professor Samten was there. and we had had a, uh, it was a big international meet on science and buddhism and uh, there was a uh, there was a group of people um, and one of a neurobiologist from um, from europe spoke about this based on her work with her colleagues which was on giving medical correlation to compassion meditation so she took a set of monks when they are doing compassion meditation uh, put certain kinds of uh, you know basically it's fmri mapping brain mapping and from that she was telling us something about what is happening when during compassion meditation and describing uh, oh, you know telling these monks oh you know the fact that you do compassion meditation and that it is good is because of these brain activities now the the problem in these kinds of ways of understanding uh, the practices of different cultures is that the only way in which you are able to understand the science and technological practices of another culture is through your own framework so uh, very she is a very obviously uh, a very open a very good scientist in her field but she was forced to try and understand these practice the, the to make meaning of the foundational concept of meditation through the framework she had which is modern biological modern uh, image making techniques etc but the question which i had for her was look you the buddhist did not produce compassion meditation by sitting under a tree and for the idea falling on their head they did they produced this technology of meditation because of their theoretical structure of the body and mind but 
that theoretical structure of body and mind is not part of your understanding when you take their compassion meditation seriously so what what is happening to this huge work on ancient indian historical work on science and technology like in dharampal ji's work is that they are being asian and african subjects are being reduced to empirical subjects who do not have the capacity to have the theoretical knowledge of what they have done that includes uh, including about ayurveda it is like oh all of you new meditation i don't know how all of you know how to do this produce is wonderful medicines i don't know how but let us give you the theoretical structure for it and this is not something very uh, you know uh, i'm not even i don't even have to imagine this the if you look at the colonial discourse by philosophers and scientists and others you will see this repeated um uh, thing as part of the colonial discourse and part of contemporary discourse today which is that ancient civilization indian civilization uh, uh, did not possess idea of theory did not possess the idea of philosophy and the, you might ask a question why do we need to respond to this we don't need to respond to this except of course unless you are in an international fora where you are producing knowledge which is shared by the larger world but more importantly you know rather than getting into the rhetoric of that for me the the very important question it uh, raises and this is my last point and i'll end with this point here is that um it allows all of us and you know with kinds of uh, programs that you are thinking of with this webathon and hopefully uh, opening up uh, access to uh, professor dharampal's work by many young scholars what it does is it opens up the possibility of showing how our contemporary world of science and technology can draw upon not reduce to can draw upon ideas from asia and africa in a very deep sense that the meaning making of the world has to draw upon the intellectual strength of societies which um, which come from asia and africa which can actually give you alternate modes of understanding the world so for example if you look at philosophy of science as a discipline and you find that it is uh, completely drawn upon uh, the whole basis of it is built on western philosophies right from the ancient greeks but it is completely silent on how you can draw upon uh, on the on indian and chinese tradition so i did a book called indian philosophy and philosophy of science to give an example you know not about indian philosophy but to show how other alternate philosophical practices particularly logical traditions in indian tradition which includes the buddhist the jaina the charvakas and others in in giving a language for understanding contemporary philosophy of science so the point is it is doable but it's a much larger project and um, you know dharampal ji uh, has to be a very important figure in catalyzing and inspiring interest in people to want to take up this kind of a project again uh, let me be very frank my point about my point about uh, why i was moving into looking at some of these indian philosophical and chinese uh, african traditions uh, was primarily because i felt that they brought in a different world view they brought in different conceptual vocabulary and they allow us to understand our contemporary world in far more interesting ways and more important in ways which may be extremely important for the future of the human race around the world that we are not in a position where we can let the interest groups of a very small group of people from very small dominant cultures to actually dictate the way the world has to evolve and that notion of the egalitarian democratic respectful practice which comes from gandhi to dharampal ji the conversion of these principles from gandhi and ambedkar into dharampal ji's own work in the context of history is an extremely important insight uh, of producing intellectual democracy of uh, engaging with opening up the ideas taking in people being inclusive in in this large uh, game of knowledge production within um, within societies and there are genuine problems as i said you would have to find the problem of language uh, there's a problem of language problem of translating concepts etc and i um, and of course dharampal ji shows us one way and for me the important point is that it we, we would be um, making a mistake if you read these books separately 
uh, even if you take just his five collected works, the five works in his collected, uh, the, the volume of his collected works, which includes um, both the Pantaj, Jiraj, uh, Civil Disobedience, India, uh, Indian Science and Technology, etc. They have to be read together because there is some in the, uh, the idea that the science and technology which is produced also has very deep connection to a society in which these other social practices were there. That's an extremely important uh, point. And to me, the point there is that Dharampalji points us to the fact that um, the social conditions of knowledge, he was speaking more on the questions of social conditions of knowledge production. And most importantly for us from the contemporary field that he was actually giving us a way for us to define what science and technology mean in the contemporary world. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sundar Sarukai, for this wonderful address. I now invite uh, Professor M.P. Mathai to give his brief observations. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you very much. You know, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Gida Tharampalji for giving this opportunity. Uh, my intention is to pay my personal homage to the memory of Dharampalji, whom I had the privilege to meet and, uh, and befriend. I recall that it was in Chennai that I first met him. Uh, and he was the guest of uh, the veteran Gandhi and Arunachalamji, who was an MLC. Uh, and it was in the company of uh, uh, and in the room of Arunachal MG in the MLC hostel that I met Dharambalji and it was Arunachal MG that introduced Dharambalji to me. And later, um, as a frequenter to uh, Sevagram Ashram, I had the opportunity to refresh my acquaintance with him. We all know that uh, Dharambalji made Sevagram Ashram his second home and he worked from there for many years. I recall, uh, you know, Karl Marx was asked about his favorites, his favorite color, his favorite name. And one of the questions was, what was his favorite hobby? And Marx answered that his favorite hobby was bookworming. And uh, in, the, in the same manner, uh, if I say that the favorite hobby of Dharambalji was worming archival materials. It would, be, it would be a mistake to say that it was his hobby. Really, it was his mission. And when I first met him in Chennai, he was there to check the archives in, in Chennai in connection with his researches. And in Sevagram Ashram, I could see that he was always encircled by young, inquisitive, educated, young men from different premier educational institutions of India. They were not only seekers of knowledge, but also were very eager to do something to change India. And Dharampalji was not only inspiring them, but he was also motivating them. And I had the opportunity to uh, to be a witness to some of the interactions that Dharampalji had with this brilliant young men from different premier educational institutions of India. And I was reminded of, uh, the, of Socrates and his young friends. You know, Socrates was always encircled by a group of young people, inquisitive and questioning young people. And I was reminded of this ancient great teacher. You know, Dharampalji wanted to give it a, a kind of uh, a systematic form to these interactions. And therefore, he formed a circle which he, which he christened Oceanic Circle. Uh, you know, it was from Gandhi that he borrowed this concept and also this name, Oceanic Circles. And unfortunately, this Oceanic Circle could not continue for uh, many years. Uh, for reasons very not very well known to me, you know, the circles faded away. 
and you know and it is the nature of oceanic circles you know the outer uh, layers the outer circles will naturally fade away and that's what happened you know of course i have be i have i've been an avid reader of uh, the books of uh, uh, dharampal ji and i know uh, the great contribution he has done to deconstructing the colonial discourse on india and the speakers before me have elaborated on this point and therefore i don't want to repeat them i would like to say uh, that it is very appropriate that in the centenary year of dharampal ji a series of programs which will bring out the importance and relevance of dharampal ji's work are going to be are organized by gida dharampal ji and it's my good fortune that i was invited to participate in this inaugural session and i i offer my best wishes to the coming programs and look forward to participating in them and benefiting from them once again i thank gida dharampal and offer my best wishes and concur thank you very much thank you thank you sir for your kind words and warm wishes i now request uh, shri pavan gupta ji to to give uh, some brief remarks and tell us about his association with dharampal ji sabhi ko namaskar uh isme shamil hone ke liye jab ankur ji ka nyota aaya to maine pucha ki main hindi mein baat kar sakta hu to unhone kaha ye acha rahega kyunki baki sabhi angrezi mein bolenge to shayad hindi mein aap bolenge to uh zyada acha rahega ek tarah ki vividhata aayegi तो मैं ये जानते हुए कि बहुत लोगों को शायद हिंदी में थोड़ी मुश्किल हो फिर भी मैं हिंदी में बोलता हूं आ, समय कम है इसलिए मैं सिर्फ एक ही बात पे अपनी बात को केंद्रित रखूंगा और वो ये है कि धर्मपाल जी का जितना भी ये पांच वॉल्यूम की बात होती है ब्यूटीफुल ट्री साइंस टेक्नोलॉजी वगैरह वगैरह इसको जब लोग पढ़ते हैं और इसकी चर्चा होती है और इसको कभी कभी अब कोशिश हो रही है कि कहीं करिकुलम में भी लाया जाए मेरा सिर्फ एक निवेदन रहेगा कि ये पढ़ते वक्त हमारा हम थोड़ा अपने आप को गौरवान्वित महसूस करते हैं हमें अच्छा लगता है कि ऐसा भी हमारा देश रहा है हमारी बहुत सारी मान्यताएं टूटती हैं ये अच्छी बात है लेकिन बात इससे ज्यादा आगे जानी चाहिए धर्मपाल जी ने जब ये काम किया वो कोई उस सेंस में स्कॉलर नहीं थे उन्होंने तो अपनी फॉर्मल पढ़ाई बीएससी भी पूरी नहीं की और बीच में छोड़ दिया तो जब लोग विद्वता की बात करते हैं तो इस देश में विद्वता कुछ और तरह की रही है उसको भी हमें देखना चाहिए और शायद धर्मपाल जी उस परंपरा को बिलोंग करते हैं उन्होंने जब ये काम किया तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि काम करते करते ये रिसर्च करते करते चीजों को खंगालते हुए ब्रिटिश आर्काइव्स को उनके कागजों को देखते दस्तावेजों को देखते देखते उनका अपना जो दिमाग एक बनते गया और वो दिमाग ये बना कि ये कैसा समाज रहा होगा एक फंक्शनिंग सोसाइटी जो भारत की वो कहते थे कि एक फंक्शनिंग सोसाइटी थी तो ये कैसा समाज रहा होगा ये सारी चीजें चाहे वो शिक्षा के क्षेत्र में हो साइंस टेक्नोलॉजी के क्षेत्र में हो खेती के क्षेत्र में हो कारीगरी के क्षेत्र में हो और व्यवस्थाएं मुख्य बात है वो व्यवस्थाएं कैसी रही होंगी जिसकी वजह से ये सब संभव हुआ और व्यवस्था अगर ऐसी कुछ जरूरी है कि व्यवस्थाएं वैसी रहे और वो आज की तरह राजकीय व्यवस्थाएं नहीं थी ये स्टेट स्पॉन्सर्ड या स्टेट कंट्रोल्ड व्यवस्थाएं नहीं थी ये सामाजिक व्यवस्थाएं थी तो ये कैसा समाज रहा होगा और उससे भी आगे बढ़ के वो दिमाग कैसा रहा होगा वो जिसकी थोड़ा जिस पर बात सुंदर सरुकाय जी ने भी की कि वो फ्रेमवर्क कौन सा रहा होगा वो दृष्टि कौन सी रही होगी 
जिसकी वजह से ये सब संभव हो पाया तो मैं उनका सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट काम जो ये सारी रिसर्च के बाद निकला जो उन्होंने भारतीय चित्त मानस काल में लिखा है तो वो भारत का मानस कैसा रहा होगा और धर्मपाल जी की शायद ये मैं मैं उनके ओर से तो नहीं कह सकता लेकिन मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि शायद वो इस कोशिश में थे कि हम उस मौलिक जो मानस भारत का रहा है उससे कनेक्ट रिकनेक्ट हो सकते हैं क्या उससे पुनः हम रिकनेक्ट हो सकते हैं क्या और इसके लिए वो कई बार कहा करते थे कि क्या ये संभव नहीं है कि भारत के किसी एक क्षेत्र को किसी एक डिस्ट्रिक्ट को सरकारी सारी नीतियों से सारी पॉलिसी से सारे एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन से अलग कर दिया जाए और वो लोगों को अपने अपने दिमाग से अपने मानस से अपने तरीकों से वो फिर से उठ खड़े हो तो शायद ऐसा कुछ हो पाए ये धर्मपाल जी हमेशा एक स्पेक्यूलेशन की बात करते थे ये खास करके हमारे देश में बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है कि हम इस बात को समझें क्योंकि हमारा पूरा का पूरा इतिहास गड़बड़ हो है ये हम सब जानते हैं हमको धर्मपाल जी का काम इसलिए भी ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट लगता है कि इस तरह की बातें किसी और ने बहुत कम हुई है तो हमारी डिस, हिस्ट्री डिस्टॉर्टेड है और हमारा इतिहास जिसको मैं हिस्ट्री से अलग मानता हूं वो भी डिस्टॉर्टेड है और हमारा सोचने समझने का तरीका पिछले सौ डेढ़ सौ साल में इस अंग्रेजी पद्धति की शिक्षा की वजह से देखने का तरीका बदल गया है जैसे साइंस की ही बात ले तो हम आ, इसमें एक छोटा सा किस्सा लाऊंगा शायद उससे बात साफ होगी एक बार रिम्पोचे जी से बात हो रही थी सम्मान्य रिम्पोचे जी इसमें भी बोले उनसे बात हो रही थी तो वो हंसते हुए बोले कि आजकल लोग बोलते हैं कि बुद्धिज्म साइंटिफिक है वो ये कहने लगे कि जब साइंस दुनिया में नहीं थी ये साइंस मॉडर्न साइंस तो बुद्धिज्म क्या था ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट बात है कि हम आज हर चीज को मॉडर्न साइंस के फ्रेमवर्क से सत्यापित करते हैं जज करते हैं देखते हैं क्या हम इस बात के प्रति सचेत हो सकते हैं कि देखने समझने के और भी तरीके हो सकते हैं और शायद वो तरीके वो दिमाग को हमको ढूंढने की चेष्टा करनी चाहिए और वो उसकी झलक और बहुत सारा इशारा है भारतीय चित्त मानस काल में कि किस तरह की रिसर्च हमको करनी चाहिए उसमें कुछ इशारा इस तरह का भी है कि हमारे जितने भी ग्रंथ हैं पुराने हमारे स्क्रिप्चर्स हैं उसमें बहुत बहुधा दो लोगों के बीच में संवाद हुए हैं वो हो सकता है वशिष्ठ और वाल्मीकि के बीच में संवाद हो वो हो सकता है भृगु और भरद्वाज के बीच में संवाद हो ऐसे दो लोगों के बीच में संवाद हैं हो सकता है कि भीष्म और युधिष्ठर के बीच में संवाद हो जैसे शांति पर्व में है इन संवादों को वो कहा करते थे कि हमको देखना चाहिए और उन संवादों को जब हम देखेंगे उसको उसकी गहराई में जाएंगे तो शायद हमको वो सूत्र मिलेंगे जो सूत्र भारत के मान साधारण भारत के मानस में गहरे बैठे हुए हैं और जिसकी वजह से भारत अगर कभी समृद्ध और शक्तिशाली था तो था उसकी वजह से था इन चीजों को हमको ढूंढना चाहिए तो ये जो शोध का कार्य है ये एक बहुत बहुत महत्वपूर्ण है लेकिन ये जो कुछ था ये संभव कैसे हुआ इसकी ओर हम अगर देखने का प्रयास करेंगे uh, I now invite, uh, Professor Gita Dharampal ji to give her concluding remarks uh, and uh, conclude this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Ankur Kakar, and I am uh, really uh, quite uh, overwhelmed by the last two hours. They were really very stimulating, and I think this was a really very fitting way to celebrate the legacy of Dharampal Ji, and in a way also to indicate the way forward. Um, but for the inaugural session, I think. all has been said so beautifully and elegantly and in a way uh, you have all squared the circle so th there is no need for any concluding remarks by me especially since we shall be continuing our discussions during the course of the year in the 11 subsequent thematic sessions 
thanks to the informed contributions of eminent experts in the respective fields. But it would be appropriate for me to articulate our heartfelt thanks to each and every one of you who has con contributed to the success of this inaugural event. Let me proceed in a sequential manner. And first and foremost, Dr. Ankur Kakar, our extraordinary moderator, both gracious and efficient, deserves our heartiest thanks for his unstinting commitment in preparing this event. Thank you, Ankur. Uh, he was the steadfast fulcrum, the nodal point behind the scenes, so to speak. And secondly, my special thanks to Dr. Ram Sharma, director of the Center for Indic Studies, for managing this event so flawlessly and for maintaining his cool, even when matters became critical. Um, and I was really impressed by your uh, in introductory speech. Thank you very much indeed. Thirdly, my deep appreciation on behalf of the Center for Indic Studies and the Gandhi Research Foundation to the four member secretaries of our national institutions for gracing this event um, with their presence, despite their many other commitments. They uh, must be named, uh, and, and in particular, I want to thank them very, very um, warmly and cordially for their erudite speeches. They must be named specifically namely Dr. Sachidanand Joshi from the IGNCA, Professor Sachidanand Mishra from the ICPR, Professor Kumar Ratnam from the ICHR, and Professor Virendra Kumar Malhotra from the ICSSR. Their enthusiastic and informed recognition of Dharampalji's contribution and their avowed support of this webathon are most greatly appreciated. And our deepest appreciation to our first speaker, Venerable Samdong Rinpoche, for his philosophical civilizational treaties, replete with spiritual insights and profound wisdom, and situating the significance of Dharampalji's uh, contribution in our endeavor to revitalize Indian civilization. To our keynote speaker, Dr. Sundar Surukai, for his lucid and illuminating talk on Dharampalji's uh, contribution um, as an avant-garde historian from a philosophical and scientific perspective in underscoring the socially and culturally embedded nature of scientific knowledge, scientific and technological knowledge and practice. Um, there will be a lot more to say about his talk, but I think we will have um, the opportunity to discuss this in more detail in the subsequent two sessions, which will be dealing with science and technology in particular. And I hope that uh, Dr. Sundar Sarukai can be uh, part of the discussion, can, um, can at least interact with this, because the, the subsequent uh, discussions, uh, webinars are going to be a lot more interactive. Then to our Gandhian scholar, Professor Matai, for my deepest uh, gratitude for his deeply empathetic observations and about underscoring my father's charismatic influence and for, in a way, um, uh, attracting successive generations of young people um, uh, in his his role as a Socrates, as an Indian Socrates. That was very, very interesting. I haven't heard that comparison being made uh, before. Um, but um, I feel that um, uh, this, this aspect of my father, the way he appealed also to the young, and I think this is still the case, and uh, the comment that was made by uh, one of the member secretaries that, that um, um, his work should be more accessible to the youth, we are trying this. This, I think, is one of the are going to be one of our key goals during this centenary year. So uh, maybe um, this his um, attraction for the youth will continue, uh, Professor Matai. <clears throat> and lastly, to Shri Pavan Gupta, who explained to us the quintessence of uh, of Dharampalji's original contribution uh, in such a reflective manner, and. Um, uh, emphasized 
um, India's original contribution to, to the world, uh, uh, to world civilization. Again, there's a lot more that can be will be said about this. And his focus uh, on one slim volume, Bharat Chitmanas and Kal. This is going to be, form the topic of a of a webinar session on uh, I think the 19th of March, to, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, where um, um, where Pavan will be, Pavan Gupta will be um, talking about this. So um, with Bharat Gupta. Um, so I think this will be a, a very important session to take forward what, uh, what Pavan uh, Gupta was able to just um, touch upon in a few words. Above all, our warmest thanks to our audience, virtual but most attentive and truly supportive of our enterprise. May you all remain loyal to us and to our special webathon we shall try and ensure that the subsequent sessions allow for audience participation. 